Welcome and good evening all. My name is Santino. I'm the Education Coordinator for Bowman to Wildflower Preserve, and it is my pleasure to welcome you back once again to our Thursday Night Nature series. Tonight, we'll be discussing cultural stories and horticulture justice with Adam DePaul. As we start, I always like to take a brief moment to recognize the Native folks who called the preserve land home prior to our existence on it. Bowman's a wildflower preserve encompasses part of the indigenous homelands of the Lenape people. We pay respect and honor the land's original inhabitants and acknowledge their displacement by European colonization. We are dedicated to being respectful and sustainable stewards to the preserve and to deepen our relationship with the Lenape people. So if this also happens to be your first Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve program, do me a favor, pop in the chat, say hello, let us know where you're joining us from. And if you happen to be catching this as a recording on YouTube after the fact, go down below into the comment section and also let us know uh, where you're coming from, because it's always great to see how far our reach has gotten. Um, also, you can comment below and let us know what you're excited for. Um, just make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel as well. All those interactions go a long way to help the preserve. If it is your first Bowman's and Wildflower Preserve program, just want to give a quick history before we get started. So we were founded in 1934. We've got two visionary individuals to thank for that. Mary Kay Perry, who is chairman of the Bucks County Federation of Women's Club, and W. Wilson Heinish, who is employed by the Pennsylvania Department of Forest and Waters, which is like the old DCNR. They imagined a sanctuary of Pennsylvania native plants, a place where people could enjoy native plant splendor all year round, uh, trails winding through fields and forests. And after some very heavy championing in October of 1934, they got the commission to set aside a 100 acre portion of Washington Crossing Historic Park as a living memorial to the patriots of George Washington's army that were camped there during the Revolutionary War. If we fast forward just a few years to the 1950s, that's when volunteer naturalists first began giving guided wildflower walks, where they detailed the history and rich cultural stories of these native plants. And that's a tradition you can still enjoy today during the growing season, April through October, during the weekends. Uh, in the 1960s is when our visitor center first opened, and it has not changed much since then. In the 1970s, we became a 501c3 nonprofit, member-supported organization, so as always, I take my proverbial hat off to our members and say thank you. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Um, it really does mean a lot to us. And if you enjoy this program and want more of it, one of the best ways you can make sure that happens is to become a member. In the 1980s, we became the nation's only accredited botanical museum dedicated to native plants. So when you visit the preserve, realize that you're not just visit, uh, visiting some kind of uh, wild area or, you know, the like. It's it's really much like the Smithsonian Institution or the Natural History Museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art, even these fine institutions. We have that same accreditation, but our collection is not paintings, artifacts, or bones. It is the living and respiring collection of about 750 different native plant species. That's about one third of all of Pennsylvania's native plants, uh, and we are truly honored to have that many. And most of those are protected by a deer exclusion fence. Um, if you happen to be a resident of a Bucks County PA, you know the resident deer population does a massive number on our uh, flora, uh, you know, uh, around the area. So that fence is very important. Uh, during tonight's program, if you would like to talk amongst yourselves, please feel free to use the chat feature. It's there for you. If you have questions for Adam, uh, I'll be curating those and asking them on your behalf at the end of the program. I ask that you use the Q&A tab uh, provided to you. That's uh, You can be found at the bottom of your Zoom um, to ask those questions. Uh, please take a moment to silence and or turn off your cell phones, though you're only disturbing whoever else is watching in the room with you. And if you need the restroom at any point, please feel free to use it. You know where it is better than I do in your own home or wherever you happen to be joining from. And as always, I encourage you all to please kick back, relax, enjoy maybe your dinner, a light snack or a beverage of your choice as we dive deep into the next of our Thursday Night Nature series. Tonight, as I said, we are joined by... Adam Waterbear DePaul, who is council member for the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania, where his role includes story keeper, academic liaison, and coordinator for the Rising Nations River Journey. And we learned a little bit about that last week. He's an instructor and a PhD candidate in cultural and mythological studies at Temple University, where he co-curated Everyday Artistry Enduring Presence in 2019. Adam, Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening and to share some of your rich stories with us. Um, without further ado, the mic, the virtual space, they're all yours. 
Well, initially, thank you, Santino, and uh, thank you to everyone at Bowman's for having us back. Um, we we have a long and very uh, treasured relationship with Bowman's. Uh, we're here all the time. Some of you might have been here just last week or the week before to see Chief Blue Jay talk about some of our people. Um, so it's it's always wonderful to talk to the Bowman's crowd. So <clears throat> I have uh, a relatively very short time to talk about not only tens of thousands of years of history, um, but also about some of our culture and some of uh, more contemporary issues surrounding dietary and food justice. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, is take you through a very, very brief abbreviated history of our people. It's not going to do any justice to our people or their, their travels or experiences. But I hope it's going to be just enough to give you an orientation so you know who the Lenape people are, in case you're unfamiliar. And um, so you know who I'm here today representing, you know, about my nation, the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm going to do that very briefly, uh, and then I'm going to move into uh, talking about some of our stories as they relate to horticulture and some uh, issues of, of um, systemic injustice that our people still face regarding that area. Uh, but please, as, as kind of briefly and abbreviated as I'm going to go through, uh, if you have any questions and you want to hear more about things, just use that Q&A function or jot them down and ask them let, later. I'll be sure to save plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, but in case you're unfamiliar, the Lenape people, we're the indigenous people of uh, eastern Pennsylvania, southern New York, <clears throat> all of New Jersey, and northern Delaware. Uh, this is what is called in our language the Lenape Hoking. And I like to stop just for a, a brief language lesson. Um, when you hear that word Lenape Hoking, what that is is it's Lenape, which means us, of course, uh, with a suffix on the end. And that suffix ends in NK. And that NK suffix uh, in our language, we put that end at the end of a word to say the place where this thing happens or the place where, where you go to find this thing. And I like to bring that up because one way that you will still encounter our culture all throughout our homelands is in the names of places, town names, river names, mountain names, area names. Um, whenever you see that NK ending on uh, the name of a place in our homelands, it's a good ind indicator that that name is bearing our language. So I live up in the Poconos in Northeast Pennsylvania, uh, Places like Machunk, Machunk, well, you would pronounce it Machunk um, in the, the Anglican pronunciation. Um, also places like Minasink, Maniunk, Passiunk, all of these names uh, carry our language in them. So uh, people live their entire lives and sometimes for generations in towns that are named in our language and yet still have very little idea of who we are. Uh, and that's because our, our history and presence here has been incredibly erased. So it's, uh, it's very valuable to us to, to be invited here to talk about our culture. Now, I'm going to zoom ahead tens of thousands of years. Uh, archaeological evidence puts our people here at least 14,000 years ago. Uh, but um, I'm going to zoom ahead all those years up to uh, colonial contact. I like to start here, especially when I have uh, a shorter presentations, because um, this story has been less told uh, even than our whole story. Uh, if you look in exhibits or in you know academic articles, you can find some information about who the Lenape people were as an as an ancient race, as an indigenous race. Um, that can be hard to find itself, but but it is there. What is even harder to find is what happened to our people after the colonists came. Uh, a lot of history books would give you the impression that somewhere around the French and Indian War, uh, all Native people just kind of evaporated, and we stopped talking and learning about them. So I like to concentrate on that area. But again, feel free to ask uh, anything about our life prior to this as well. But I like to begin talking about this. Uh, I like to begin with William Penn, 
many people have heard legends about about William Penn and how he uh, treated our people. And they ask, uh, because we know that sometimes when we hear these legends, they're not always faithful uh, to the truth, and we should investigate them. But if you've heard uh, legends about William Penn being, you know, a very good uh, having a very good relationship with our people, there is much truth to that. Uh, Penn did go out of his way and and above and beyond the other colonial leaders of his time in establishing friendly, respectful relationships with our people. Uh, we treasured our relationship with Penn back then, and we still treasure it today. Uh, we actually... Um, call on that relationship in a treaty that we sign every four years, which I'll talk about in a minute when I get up to what we're doing today. Uh, Penn was not a perfect human being. If we uh, examine him, you know, with our with our hundreds of years of hindsight, we can definitely find many things to criticize and many things should be examined, uh, not the least of which is his relationship to the slave trade. Uh, so I don't mean to hold him up as a as a perfect human being. But as far as how he treated our people, uh, he really did try to do it in, in a good way. One example I like to bring up to emphasize this is that Penn learned a, a version of our language, a very simplified version, but enough to communicate. And then he trained some of his people in our language. And the reason he did this is because uh, he realized that our people were being taken great advantage of in written dealings, land dealings, treating, treaty dealings. Uh, people were just holding these documents in front of us and saying, hey, make these marks at the bottom. Um, and in, in good faith with these new neighbors, our people were often signing these things with little to no understanding of what they meant. Um, and, and Penn didn't want that to be the way they conducted business with us. So uh, after teaching some people his, our, after teaching some of his people our language, he insisted that there be a Lenape interpreter at any written dealing uh, with our people that, that involved the exchange of property so that someone could explain to us exactly what that meant. So I think just that much speaks a lot about William Penn. Uh, where things went wrong, uh, drastically is in just one short generation with uh, Penn's descendants. Penn was only here for a very short time. He came over here, he established um, some, some ways of doing things, he got things set off in a good direction, but then he was back over the ocean. Uh, his descendants remained here, and his sons, his grandsons, and the era of colonists they ushered in, they wanted nothing to do with the spirit of their father. Um, in fact, Penn's sons had formally renounced Quakerism, so they followed him neither in faith or in, in his spirit towards our people. Penn's descendants wanted our land <clears throat> and wanted us gone. Uh, the most well-remembered and, and currently still talked about, I you might say the most popular example of how Penn Sons would orchestrate ways to to cheat us out of our signing away our land uh, is the walking purchase. Um, because <clears throat> I want to move on to some other subjects, I'm not going to go into detail about the walking purchase right now. Uh, feel free to ask about it if you're curious. You can also find a lot of information about this online. We also have a documentary uh, that addresses the walking purchase uh, right now. We have information about that on our website. But long story, very short, uh, the walk during this walking purchase, we had agreed to give Penn sons an amount of land, largely out of respect for their father so that they could live here as our neighbors and, and we could move forward in a good way together. And through a series of manipulations, um, where we thought we were giving away a good couple acres for you know a family settlement, Penn Sons ended up tricking us into signing away uh, about 1,200 square miles of land in Pennsylvania. That's about roughly equal to the size of Rhode Island State. Uh, it was devastating to our people. And uh, one of the uh, obvious major signs that we were no longer uh, participating in that spirit of friendship that William Penn, their father, had established. Now, uh, after, like I said, the walking purchase is just the most 
remembered example. There were many other examples of how Penn's sons and, and that era and the following era would trick us into signing away possessions and land. And after this uh, went on for some time, then it came time where they had enough of that secured on these legal documents and it was time to get our people out uh, because that was their interest. So uh, what I have here is, uh, this is actually an artifact we have at our cultural center, which is in Easton, Pennsylvania. We have this blown up to a, a full wall size, so it's very easy to read. This is the Pennsylvania Gazette from 1764, in which John Penn, uh, William Penn's grandson, publicizes in the front page, first column, prices that he will pay uh, to anyone who turns in Lenape scalps or who captures and brings in live Lenape people. And those of us brought into captivity under these bounties would very often then be sold into forced labor, either here in our homelands or we'd be packed on boats and shipped over the ocean to the East Indies to be uh, used as forced labor over there. So uh, at this point, obviously, it becomes not only evident that uh, we are no longer uh, participating in, in friendship with the colonists, um, not only evident that uh, there's some mistrust and manipulation here, but that we are in danger. We are actively being hunted. Uh, and it is at this point that our people as a geographic entity, as a people that live all together in one area, become fractured. So as our uh, people are, are beginning to be hunted and, and brought in on these bounties, uh, our people begin to scatter. And at this uh, time period, many of our people are forcibly removed from our homelands. Not all, and I'll talk about those who weren't in a minute, um, but many of our people were, they either picked up their, their families and fled to escape being hunted, um, or many of them tried to dig in and, and put up resistance. And there were some battles as our people tried to resist being pushed out by the military or by uh, gangs of people who were, who were looking to bring them in. Um, but still, many of our people were forcibly removed. And of those of our people who were of those of our diaspora, they went in all directions. They went anywhere they could uh, and as far as they could until they could look around and start feeling a bit safe, like, okay, things might be okay here. Now, these, these forced removals, these are not a one-day event. It wasn't like one day all the Lenape picked up from Pennsylvania and walked out to Wisconsin and sat down, and, and that's how they moved. You know, we would get out as far as western Pennsylvania or, or maybe middle New York, um, what is today, those things, of course, um, and look around and things might feel safe, and we'd begin to resettle and reestablish our community and our horticulture. Uh, but of course, the frontier or new waves of, of colonists would catch up with us, we'd be uprooted again and chased further, and then it's out in Ohio, Indiana. Kansas and on and on and on. So these removals are, are the process of years and decades, and in some cases, even centuries of continuous upheaval and uh, partial resettlement, and then re-upheaval again and again and again. As a result of this, in, in uh, a few decades, there are Lenape people all throughout the country and continent. Uh, and um, Today, there are five nations of Lenape people of that diaspora uh, that, that represent those who were forced to leave. Um, their flags are the first five I have on the screen here. Um, those five nations, three of them are in the United States, uh, two of them are in Oklahoma, one is in Wisconsin, and then some of our people got pushed over what is now the United States border and settled in uh, Canada, and we have two nations in Ontario, Canada today. Those are the five, then the only five federally recognized nations of Lenape people today. And I won't go into detail that uh, in this summary about that, but if you're interested in how recognition works and hearing more about that, feel free to ask about that too. Uh, our diaspora are also, of course, represented by uh, smaller communities and individuals 
all over the country. We have uh, communities in Kansas and Ohio and elsewhere. But to to bring the focus back to the homelands, like I said, uh, not all of our people were forced to leave. Uh, many of our people did remain here. And there's a number of ways that could happen. Some of our people broke off into small groups and went into hiding. Unfortunately, many of our people were brought in on bounties like John Penn's or, or other similar bounties, and they remained here as somebody's property. But the most numerous way that our people remained here in the homeland was through marriages between almost exclusively in, in the first unions, almost exclusively between Lenape women and colonial men. Um, backing up a bit before the walking purchase, before William Penn, to some of the earliest contacts, the first colonists that came over, um, there were many good relationships. Many of our people met in friendship. There's a scholar, Robert Grumet, who writes that as early as the 1600s, there are Lenape children being born with curly hair and freckles. Uh, and of course, he notes that to emphasize how uh, quickly and, and early our people had met and began uh, not only being friends, but raising families together. Um, colonial men tended to take a very strong liking to marrying our women, and there's many reasons for that, but the, the primary reason is that our women were the masters of horticulture. Uh, they had incredible knowledge, not just of how to work the soil and make it produce, but how to work with the land and with all of our relations uh, so that the land would uh, produce for the community, but would do so in ways that wouldn't ravage it and leave it dead. So we didn't have to take up huge plots of land and then uh, move all the time because that land wouldn't produce again for another five years because we had worked it so hard. Uh, they knew how to, how to do horticulture in harmony. And they knew this from, again, tens of thousands of years of working that particular soil. So that was, of course, incredibly valuable to the colonists who were on foreign soil and had no idea uh, how the seasons worked, what crops would raise and what wouldn't. Uh, and those early colonists were largely dependent on our women and their knowledge. Um, oh, and, and not just their knowledge, our women were also the workers. They did the work. They lived that farmer's life from, from uh, you know, morning till night. Um, and then, of course, the colonists loved that, too. So it was largely due to our women that the colonists were able to survive and thrive here uh, in, uh, to the extent that they were in those first uh, few decades, at least. Now... In those early marriages, um, very often uh, children would be raised in both cultures. For instance, children might uh, very often would be bilingual. They'd grow up speaking Lenape and German or Lenape and Swedish, whatever the, the dominant language of the household was. <clears throat> However, as we get to the time of the walking purchase and the forced removals, this is no longer the case. At this period, uh, as our people are, are being hunted uh lenape culture is not welcome in the homelands anymore if you are one of these lenape people even if you have generations of families established here uh with uh you know lenape colonist families uh for generations uh you are still not welcome to openly show this culture if you are a lenape people a lenape person who remains in the homeland you can't speak your language we can't dress in our traditional dress we certainly can't hold any uh, spiritual or religious ceremonies um we we speak we dress uh, and we otherwise act as the dominant culture, and we hope that uh, that is enough to let us be uh, left alone, not persecuted, and not driven out of our homelands. Uh, however, uh, we don't let our culture die, and we are forever indebted to our ancestors who, who refuse to. Uh, even though you could not talk or look or otherwise signal to the community that you were Lenape, our people continued to pass on their culture. They did this almost exclusively through the oral tradition, 
tradition, uh, as was always the tradition of our people. So grandparents would tell their grandchildren, parents would tell their children, our language, our culture, our ceremonies, so that that knowledge didn't die. But along with those teachings, uh, they would pass the teaching that you must keep this to yourself, you must hide this, never forget it. Um, but you cannot talk about this, you cannot give any indication of this, uh, because it is incredibly dangerous to do so. Now, in addition to orally passing down knowledge, uh, they also found ways of, of giving visual reminders, visual reinforcement of their heritage. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a, is a stencil. And uh, the stencil is somewhat uh, fairly um, emulates kind of a typical German stencil uh, that, that would not seem out of place uh, to your average uh, colonist coming through a household. But this stencil was found exclusively in homes where there were Lenape people. And uh, if you analyze this closely, you see semblances of Lenape art in here. The, the dot in the middle of a form is often a symbol for the soul in Lenape art, and the figure on the left uh, very much calls to mind a little dancer. If you turn your head and, and look at a person dancing, you can see it. So uh, this stencil would be found always at eye level uh, in the kitchen of homes where Lenape people were, and this would blend in with the dominant culture, but also signal to the Lenape people uh, as a as a visual reminder of their Lenape culture. Uh, we have many artifacts like this and other examples in uh, an ex the exhibit at our cultural center in Easton. Uh, but here's one more I always like to show because I think this is one of the most uh, potent. Um, here's a little doll and dolls like this would often be passed from Lenape grandmothers to their grandchildren and it looks you know just like a normal little doll it's got a nice little textile dress nice little smile light skin um, but if you turn this doll around and if you lift up the hair on the back of the head what you'll find is another face stitched in the back of the head uh, very hard to see even when you know it's there and you're looking for it. It was always sewn in the same color as the cloth so as to make it difficult to see. Uh, but that second face hidden under the hair was another visual reminder to our children that you have this uh, these two faces when you live here and one is the one that you put forward. But never forget that you also have your Lenape face even though you have to keep it hidden. So for hundreds of years, uh, our, our people passed down this knowledge through the oral tradition and through uh, material culture. Um, under the noses uh, of the colonists, often what we call hiding in plain sight, even through the most, uh, you know, treacherous times of uh, what is often called the Indian boarding schools, when our children are being uh, literally taken, forced from our families and forced into schools where they are being uh, having their hair cut, having any native clothes or possessions stripped from them, and where they are being processed to uh, forget and to lose and to, uh, to find distasteful their native heritage so that they can be returned to society as civilized human beings. Um, even when these threats are looming over our families, our ancestors continue um, to pass on their knowledge. And a quick note, I say ancestors, um, but uh, this is not ancient history. I often bring this up to my college students who, who kind of think, you know, this stuff happened ages ago. Um, we still have elders in our society who remember being taken from their families and put into these boarding schools. Uh, this is in our living memory. It's, it's people's parents, grandparents, some of my students' great-grandparents. Um, but this is not ancient history. This is also our, our living elders. But even through that period, we continue to pass down our knowledge, our culture. We refuse to let it die. And as a result, um, today, there is still a, a 
powerful and thriving Lenape culture and community all throughout the homelands. Uh, so I am here uh, today from uh, the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. That's my nation. And uh, this is our heritage. We are we represent those Lenape who never left their homeland. And we are not the only nation with that lineage. Right over the river in New Jersey, you have the Ramapo Mountain Lenape up in North New Jersey. In South New Jersey, you have the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape. And excuse me, in, in Delaware State, you have the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware. And all four of our nations um, are largely representative of the, the Lenape who never left the homelands. Um, and also some Lenape who left uh, out to Ohio, thereabouts, but then doubled back and came back to, to stay here. Now, our nation today uh, is very focused on maintaining our culture and revitalizing those aspects of our culture that were most ravaged by colonialism. And uh, one example of, of our uh, process in trying to revitalize our culture is our language. Our language is incredibly endangered, um, but our nation is very fortunate, and I'm very unfortunate, that uh, one of... Um, the, the most prolific and incredible keepers of our language is, is actually my mother, a clan mother, Shelley DePaul, who is our director of language. She's dedicated her life to bringing the language back to our people, to revitalizing it. Uh, she taught the language for years at Swarthmore. This is a publication in, in a wonderful book on endangered languages about her class. Um, Today, we teach six classes a week uh, on the Lenape language to anybody who wants to come and learn it, um, no matter their background or interest. We have our people. We have just members of the community who saw it on our website and said, hey, that sounds fun. We have professors of linguistics and anthropology, um, a wonderfully diverse group of students. Um, the, the last bit I want to talk about is... Uh, something else we're very passionate about, which is maintaining our role as what we would say in English, as good stewards of the environment, being in harmony with all of our relations. And by that, I, I don't just mean all the two leggeds of all backgrounds and races and, and creeds, but I mean the four leggeds, the creepy crawlers, the standing trees, the, um, the grandfather stones, all everything we see around us that supports and contributes to our existence and one way we've continued uh, our our timeless tradition of being a steward of the uh, environment is through the rising nation river journey and the treaty of renewed friendship there's much more information about this on our website um, and also feel free to ask uh, more about this, but very briefly, in 2002, uh, we had been working with a number of wonderful environmental organizations. We decided to bring them all together. We uh, came up with the Treaty of Renewed Friendship that basically asked its signers to acknowledge the Lenape as the indigenous people and to be good stewards of the environment. And then to spread the treaty and to celebrate it, uh, we went out to our sacred river, the Delaware River, uh, in canoes and kayaks, and we paddled the entire river, every inch from up in Hancock, New York, down to Cape May, New Jersey, about four weeks on the river. Um, we stopped all along the way to hold treaty signings and to invite the public to come and, and join in this treaty. And at the end of those four weeks, we had 17 organizations come to sign the treaty, many of them wonderful uh, environmental organizations like the Audubon Society, Delaware River Keepers, Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic. Um, we've continued this. We do it every four years since 2002. And uh, just summer 22, last year, last summer, uh, was our 20-year anniversary, and at the end of that journey, we had over 130 organizations and over 300 committed individuals come to sign the treaty. Uh, it's just been incredible to see how many people have signed on, and our partners are, like I said, many environmental organizations, but that's not nearly all. We have uh, Arboretums, um, 
historical societies, academic institutions, uh, colleges, school districts, elder societies, uh, faith-based organizations of, of all faiths, all denominations of churches and other faiths and multi-faith organizations. Um, so the friendships and the collaborations we've established through that have been just incredible. So, like I said, there's there's much more information about all of that on our website. Our website is lenape-nation.org. Um, but that is all I want to uh, talk at you about regarding our, our history and presence, and I hope that gives you a somewhat of an orientation uh, to who we are. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about... Um, our stories and our culture provide a, uh, in relation to horticulture. So let's see, I don't want to leave, but I want to stop screen sharing. So we're going to figure out how to do that. Um, one of my roles in the nation is uh, tribal story keeper. Ooh. And uh, as story keeper, I keep many types of stories in our nation. I keep stories about, um, oh, thank you, Santina. I was struggling with that. No problem. Uh, I, I got you. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and, and one of the types of stories I keep are traditional stories. Uh, what you might call our mythologies or our cultural stories, those that explain to us the way things came to be. And, and many of those stories, the significant majority of those stories have common themes running through them of humility towards all of our relations, plant, animal, and all other, and um, appreciation for all the bounties that we are offered from our relations and, and from the river and from the watershed, from the earth. Um, right now, we're in the season of one of our uh, major ceremonies. This is uh, the season of the Meesing ceremony. And I won't tell the whole Meesing story because it's long and it doesn't have directly to do with horticulture, but it sets a good stage for um, that that overall spirit of humility. In our creation story, we two-legged, we human beings, we were the last of creation. Everything else was created before us. Uh, and when it came time to uh, make the two-legged, we almost didn't make the cut. Uh, at that time, all of our four-legged relations, the winged nation, all the animals got together and they said, these two-leggeds, mm -mm, they're going to be trouble. Um, we, need to, we need to get creator to stop this. Uh, so there's a, a long story where they call on Misink, who is the, garden, the guardian of the forests and the forest animals. And there's a contest where Misink tries to uh, appeal to Kishalamukon, creator, to not make the two-legged. Misink is hit in the face with a mountain, and there's a discussion after that. And you know how the story ends already, because we're here. Um, so... Uh, creator uh, came out on top on that contest and, and the two leggeds were created. But that sets the stage for understanding that our participation in the world is um, one of humility and is also contingent upon all of our other relations. And we consistently keep that in our mind as we move forward in all things. Now, <clears throat> Uh, many of our stories have to do with particular uh, plants or particular harvests that, that were important to our people. And uh, I want to briefly give a summary of one that, that came down to me uh, from uh, many sources, but most memorably from my elder now past, um, Philip Grey Wolf uh, Rice. Uh, walked the May. And he would tell a story of uh, the Wamatanakis, uh, sometimes referred to as wood dwarves. Um, but 
uh, he told a story of uh, a child and his grandfather who were walking through the woods and the child trips over a stone and falls into a big spider web and then panics and swats at the web and is very upset. And, and in order to calm him down, his grandfather sits him down and he tells him about the Wamat Nakasak. Uh, and these, he says, these are uh, small people, small two-leggeds that live in the forest and they are Mising's helpers. Uh, as powerful as, as the great spirit Mising is, he can't keep an eye on everything that happens in every acre of forest everywhere. So he has the Wamatanakisak to help him. And everything in the forest is a device of theirs to help gather information. Those big stones that you step on or trip over, uh, the Wamatanakisak are under that. And they use that to weigh you, to find out how big are the creatures coming through. Uh, and they work with the chalabutasak, the, the spiders, to weave those big webs between the trees. And that when one of us two-leggeds comes lumbering through and walks through them, uh, those webs actually vibrate and it gives them an imprint of what the person looks like by wrapping around them and then sends that information through the trees. And many of the, the particular plants are used by uh, the, the little two-leggeds. And one in particular is the jack-in-the-pulpit, uh, or what is sometimes called the Indian jack-in-the-pulpit. And if you've ever seen the jack-in-the-pulpit, it has this that fascinating uh, bend. It, it comes up, and then its leaf curls over, and it looks almost like a bell shape, um, or, a, or a, some kind of scoop. And the Wamatanakasak are, are particularly fond of this plant because they go underground and they, they uh, nestle into the roots of this plant. And then they turn the plant this way and that, and that wonderful shape of the plant uh, serves as, uh, you might think of it in contemporary times, as a kind of radar dish that catches sound so they can listen throughout all the forest and see what's going on and hear what people are talking about. And if they see or hear anything that is alarming, they can report that back to me. Um, and then the story continues with the grandson being calmed. And at the end, he, he before leaving the forest, he runs up to one of the jack in the pulpits and whispers inside, uh, Wanishi Misink, thank you, Misink, for watching over the forest. Um, so there are uh, particular, uh, particular members, particular relations of ours, like the jack in the pulpit always bring us joy. All of them bring us joy, but many of them have particular stories. Um, one I like to also bring up is, uh, it's a, it's a story about the time when our people were here with one of the biggest and most powerful creatures on earth, uh, big and powerful four-legged, the mammoth. And, uh, at one time the, the mammoth looked around and, um, said, you know, all of these other creatures are so tiny. Uh, there's no reason for us to just be walking around with them like we're buddies. We should be lording over these creatures. Uh, we are big, we are strong, and we should be respected above all things. So the mammoth waged war on all of our animal relations. And the battle was intense and lasted a long time because Mammoth was very strong. And although all the animals came to help support and, and try to protect themselves from the Mammoths, the Mammoths were ravaging all of our relations. Uh, so this went on and on and on until things looked very bad for all our relations. And at a point, Kishola Mukong uh, saw what was happening and and decided that he had to help uh, offer support or else all our relations were going to be extinct except for the mammoth. So he started, uh, he made it to rain. He started a great rain to come or he called on, on the thunders, on the, the uh, grandfather thunders to come and make it rain and rained and rained and rained. And as this battle went on, what happened is the ground became very soft, flooded, muddy and the mammoths under their great bulk and power and weight began sinking 
into the mud and they found it harder and harder to navigate as they were chasing our, our relations and fighting them. They'd have to pick up further and further to, to get their legs out of the mud and they continued to sink and sink and sink until the last mammoths had sunk under the earth and could no longer be seen. And then finally, our relations were were uh, free from the the dominant terror of the mammoths. But this brought another problem. Because it had rained so long and uh, for, for such a long time, and because the ground was so saturated, uh, nothing was growing. Um, all the plants were flooded, and there was very little food for any of our animals to find. Um, in fact, a lot of them were doing all they could do just to keep their heads above water and crawling on turtles back and then getting support from the winged nation and whoever else they could to look around for, for the rare shoot hanging above the water. So uh, as the water um, was high and, and Kishala Mukong saw our relations struggling for food, uh, he looked down and he he thought about this and he made something to grow um, out of the blood of the mammoth from under those bogs. He created a berry and he made a, a bush and a bush that would grow berries from those bogs. Uh, and those berries were the substance of the blood of the mammoth so that even in death, those mammoths could uh, still contribute to all their relations since they hadn't done a great job of doing that. Uh, before they decided to take over. And as I'm sure there are many um, horticulture-based people here, you might have already imagined that the berry that came from, from the mammoth is what we call cranberries today. Uh, and of course, still carries the, the color of the blood of those mammoths. Um, the, the last thing I want to mention uh, as far as our stories, and there are many more that I'd be happy to talk about if you've heard of some, but I didn't mention them, um, is that we have a tobacco story. Tobacco is incredibly important to our people. It always has been. Uh, and I won't go through the whole tobacco story either, because that's another long story, uh, as it's very important to our culture. Uh, but uh, again, kind of summary of the story is that our people are at war this time it's the two leggeds uh, all the two leggeds are fighting each other over a particular charm a powerful charm um, and the war gets worse and worse and the two leggeds are, are getting more and more um, harmful to each other so uh, Kishala Mukong once again he he sends over one of our great spirits uh, like Misink, but not Misink. This is Moskim, another one of our spirits. And Moskim uh, gives to our people tobacco, and he teaches them how to make a pipe. And he uh, spreads this knowledge and a ceremony with the pipe to all of our people, and he tells our people, whenever you're coming together uh, to hold counsel or to make decisions or to even talk about difficulties, I want you to take this uh, tobacco in this pipe and I want you all to smoke it. And when you bring that smoke into you, you will be uh, bringing in uh, a good spirit. And when you exhale that smoke, all of your thoughts and wishes will come out with that smoke and mingle with the thoughts and uh, wishes of all the other people smoking that pipe. And together they will all go up to creator. And that will help guide you in making decisions that are good for everybody and that um, coincide with the, the best good for everybody. Uh, I like to bring that up because it's a wonderful example of a very sacred and important plant for our people. Um, and I also like to emphasize that Creator and Muskeem didn't give us uh, Philip Morris, right? Um, yes, we, we hold very high in esteem tobacco, but it has a ceremonial use uh, and it's a medicine to be respected and used in certain situations. Um, now, the, the last thing I want to uh, talk on, and I'm going to talk on this very briefly, um, is 
I, I want to bring in an idea about uh, justice, about access, and almost everything I've learned about this, I've learned from our incredible clan mother, Dr. Ann Dappis, and she is just brilliant and, and learned and publishes on this subject all the time. Um, but since we're on, on the, the subject of plants and food and, and plant medicine and dietary culture, uh, it's important to understand that one thing, one of the huge, not just ramifications of colonization, but contributing factors of colonization was the colonization of our food. Um, with colonization came, of course, uh, with, with all the atrocity and, and everything else that came with it, our people were, uh, you know, pushed and pushed and pushed and cornered into these little areas of land very often uh, that we might call reservations. And other of our people were forced to assimilate and take up colonial diets and, and diets that were foreign to them. And they left behind a lot of uh, the the diets, the the uh, plant food that they had grown up with for, for tens of thousands of years and to which they had become accustomed. And the diets that were forced upon them uh, included things that did not work very well with our, our literal physiology, things like um, white flour and refined sugar. Um, today, our people are incredibly overrepresented in dietary related health issues, things like uh, anything anything stemming from obesity, diabetes, heart disease. Um, and also, uh, of course, along with the change in diet came a number of uh, factors of access. So often being relegated to the margins of society, of course, our people uh, often didn't have access to financial systems um, or, or the, the best jobs in society, and many of them couldn't afford uh, good food. Uh, and as time went on, many of our people, we, are, we have also historically been over, overrepresented on um, receiving food from the government and being very low income and, and relegated to places of poverty. And of course, uh, the food that, that the government hands out to these types of communities, and of course, the Lenape and Native Americans are not the only uh, community that have, that have been marginalized in this area. Um, but you know we're not getting three sisters bean soup, and and um, you know uh, our, our traditional healthy foods through these programs. Uh, a lot of it is prepackaged and based very strongly on these uh, sugars and and refined flours to which we're not accustomed. So this combination of um, losing our much of our cultural diet through forced assimilation and through removal of our homelands combined with um the the financial barriers and and being relegated to areas where we don't have access to purchase to be able to afford uh that type of food has taken a huge and continuing lasting toll on our people um and we have a very strong effort to try to bring our diet back to our community uh, to, to help offset that over-representation, that, um, that colonial, that systemic colonial uh, lingering um, dietary health problem that exists in our community. Uh, we have books, uh, we have, a, we uh, have books on Lenape uh, traditional diets, derived from our traditional plants. We have books on indigenous plant medicine, um, and we love doing uh, programs anywhere like Bowman's and, and other places that really emphasize the importance of our natural environment um, and our, our natural and especially indigenous plants. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking at you. Um, I really want to hear your comments, your questions. Uh, let me know what interests you, what you'd like to hear more about, or something I didn't mention at all. Oh my gosh. Thank you.
thank you so much. This was truly um, just magical, eye-opening, wonderful. I mean, all all the accolades. I, I really could just sit here and listen to you go on and on with the stories and history. It is... <sighs> It's a piece that's, you know, sadly not shared as widely as it should. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of us that um, we appreciate you joining us to share all of this. Um, as we, I'm going to give folks a chance to pop into the Q&A tab again and ask your questions. I see some folks had already jumped in there. I want to give a shout out to Carolyn for sharing the Lenape Nation website in the chat. Yeah. Uh, as I send out the recording of this, I will uh, also include that, of course, for everyone to um, really just link right back to you guys. Um, so just my end of house housekeeping. Of course, as I said, if you enjoyed this program and want more of it, please consider being a member or giving to our uh, end of year appeal. Um, membership really is one of the best ways to make sure we can still do what we do. And we do try to make it worth our members while. Um, some of the benefits include waived admission fees to the preserve, um, discounts on programming, discounts on native plants, um, and we're doing more and more for our members. In fact, we have a lecture coming up this Saturday uh, with Larry Wiener, who um, that is free for our members. I talked about those guided wildflower walks with our docents, our naturalists. Those are also free for members. Um, so yeah, consider that. Join us at the preserve. We'd love to see you and have you be part of our family. We've got some great upcoming programs. I mentioned Larry Wiener. Uh, we've got, of course, our Wild Gentle Yoga series. We're continuing that indoors, not outdoors at our moss garden. Um, it's a wee bit chilly on Wednesday mornings for that, but uh, we encourage you to come out. If you have a wee tyke, a budding naturalist, we've got our Fourth Fridays for Families programs coming up on November 17th is the next one with Pam Newitt. We'll be discussing our wild turkey, the terrific turkey trek. And of course, the final of our Thursday Night Nature Series program will be with Karina Ran, uh, and she's with TerraCycle, learning how we can recycle just about everything, and that'll be next week. Uh, same bad time, same bad place, Thursday at 7, so hopefully that you'll uh, be able to join us for that. All right, um, you're getting all the accolades in the chat, so holler that, that's awesome. Um, all right, let's jump into some questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, Joan had one that was brought up a little bit last week, um, and if you wouldn't mind touching on that, um, kind of the state recognition of PA. Why does PA not recognize Indigenous nations? Can you talk about states um, that do and what kind of goes into that and the why, who's against and what? Just, you know, a brief overview for us. Sure. Um, so there's two things. There's federal recognition and state recognition. Um and I'll go over this very quickly. Email me. I talk about just this for two hours sometimes, so I can talk more in detail later. But none of our four Eastern homeland nations will ever be eligible for federal recognition unless changes are made to the law. And that has to do with uh, the fact that we had to hide and assimilate to keep our culture going. What we can get is state recognition. And in our homelands, of the states in our homelands, Pennsylvania is the only state that has never recognized any of its native people. Our relations in New Jersey are uh, recognized by New Jersey. Um, Delaware is recognized by Delaware. Pennsylvania has not recognized uh, either the Lenape or any of the other tribes. We do have a very strong push to change that. And actually on our website right now, we have an online petition and a letter writing campaign. Um, and we've been honored to see so many uh, people that have signed on to that to offer their support right now. And we are meeting with legislators. So we're hoping to see that changed. It's really an historic time in Pennsylvania right now. Um, thank you for asking about that and bringing it up. So would state recognition be one step towards that federal recognition? In theory, yes. And, and to me as an idealist, I'm going to say yes. Um, however, even with state recognition, federal laws would need to be changed that right now exclude any of our four nations out here from access to federal recognition. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Joan also had 
uh, would love just a little bit more elaboration on the historical environmental stewardship of the Lenape. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And again, this won't do it justice, but um, historically, this is something I like to bring up. Um, you know, of course, our ancestors faced challenges and, and, and terrors that we will never know. Um, uh, but there are, there are also some things that we face today that our ancestors could not have imagined. Uh, for the majority of our history, being a good steward of all our relations, living in harmony, it came down to a, a very simple but very respectful philosophy towards everything. You know, live in harmony, don't take more than you need, give back whenever you can, and consider yourself uh, alongside everything, not above everything. And if you acted every day in those principles and in, in the way you did everything, things would go pretty well. Now, of course, today we have issues of industrialism. Our, our ancestors didn't have to deal with getting microplastics out of the water with the danger of, of fracking um, and, and that kind of fallout and all these issues we have to deal with today. So this is one of the major motivations uh, for us going for state recognition is so that we can be brought to the table in these kind of projects and have a voice in what happens in our homelands. Right now, we don't. Nobody has to talk about us if they want to dam up the Delaware or come in and build warehouses wherever they want. Um, we could change that through state recognition. Uh, however, uh, because of our wonderful partnerships and our wonderful treaty signers, uh, people like the Delaware Riverkeepers, Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic, they keep us abreast of these things. So we do know about them. And we've re we've resisted, for instance, the Tox Island Dam, uh, resisted the Penn East Pipeline. Um, we work on any projects that, that come through and threaten our environment or homeland, and we're always very active. Uh, oh, if you're interested in, in what we're doing day to day, you can also email us our information on the website and tell us that you'd like to join our newsletter. Um, and we always have calls to action and our environmental initiatives in our newsletter. Um, right now, uh, one of the things we're very invested in is supporting our our friends in Chester community who are rising up to try to resist a fracking gas hub being built in their community and displacing um, a lot of their people. So uh, you can find more information about that in the website and newsletter as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your continued environmental actions. I mean, it, it goes a long way, not only for the Lenape people, right? But but all of us, we all share in this, this great planet, this great earth. Um, and I just have to laugh, you know, gosh, the four legs knew. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, what are we better with or without these two legs? I don't know, creator. Um, they they usually do. We have right? a lot to learn. And, mm -hmm. We do. It's very, very humbling. Um, yeah. So historically, can you talk uh, about the Lenape relationship with neighboring groups? You know, I'm originally from central New York. I saw you had the Mohawk um, on the on the map. How were the how were their relationships with the neighboring tribes? <laughs> Um, the, the Lenape people were actually called the Grandfather Tribe by many of the Northeast Wilderness Tribes here. Uh, we were considered by many the, the oldest people and the original people. Uh, the name Lenape, the word Lenape actually translates roughly into original people. Um, our people were known as peacekeepers and as arbiters. In fact, there were uh, very often when other tribes were having disputes, they would come to the Lenape to help uh, arbitrate that and 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 see that through in a good way and try to avoid or mitigate animosity and send people off in a good way. Um, so we're we're very honored to have been called that and and offered that role among many other tribes. Now. <clears throat> Very briefly, this is another little tidbit. Some people um, have heard that the, the Lenape and the Iroquois were enemies. And I like to pause on this for a minute because there's, there's a seed of some factual support from that. But if you examine this, it's a wonderful uh, example of, of the uh, 
fallout and activities of colonialism. Um, because the, the primary motivator that led to trouble between our two communities were the beaver trade and uh, colonialism coming over here and introducing a, a consumerism to which the likes of which we've never seen before. Um, very quick bullet points here in the Lenape Hoking, we're on prime beaver territory. Uh, the, the, the people that come over the ocean, they love the beaver pelts. They want all they can get. They begin commissioning people to hunt beaver, not just saturating their new colonial market here, but shipping it over the ocean to saturate the European market. And from there, shipping it to the East Indies where they're colonizing that area. So all of a sudden we have a worldwide trade here. It becomes a very valuable commodity. And uh, the colonists go over to the Iroquois and get in their ear and say, hey, if you help us get the Lenape out of this land, uh, you can then take, we'll deal with you with the beaver trade and you can be uh, profiting from this. And unfortunately, some some of that nation, not all, but some uh, of that nation were seduced by those promises. And uh, that's where the wars between our two people um, uh, became very, uh, very violent. Uh, and then, of course, after that went through, the colonists turned on them as well, as we all know now. But, uh, but yeah, for the, for the most part, and particularly without the, the yeah, exacerbation of the colonists, um, our people were very well respected as peacekeepers. Excellent. Um, and you know what? It blows my mind that not only it's it's weird to it's troubling to think not only what the early colonists just uh, tantalizingly coaxed other you know folks into doing, but I mean that's led to the expert extirpation of the beaver from Pennsylvania. Um, I mean we didn't have any beaver left in the state um, because of this trade, and that's just really. Um, unsettling jaw dropping and and the like yeah. um, so can you briefly discuss the historic roles of different lenape people members so your role currently right is storyteller your mother is keeper of language um were those historical roles or are those you know roles that have changed over time yeah that's a great question so um where do let, let's start with chiefs um I am one of the four chiefs of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. Um, many people are surprised to hear that. When they hear chief, they think, well, there is one chief who is the chief of the nation. Um, the idea of having a single person that rules over an entire race or ethnicity, uh, that is very rarely, if ever, um, how Native Americans conducted themselves. Our people, the Lenape, always had multiple chiefs. That idea was actually introduced to us from uh, our neighbors from across the ocean, and it carried the idea of the aristocracy over of a king leading over all his people. It also provided an incredibly convenient way for the colonists to uh, take our land and our other position, possessions because they could find somebody um, and say, hey, we talked to the chief of the Lenape, and he said, sure, take this land and we'll go here. Um, and that was very often the case. There are treaties signed with people who are listed as the chief of the Lenape when you know 80% of our people had never heard of this person or more. So it was also a very uh, convenient um manipulation by the colonists uh, and of course that image of who is your chief was immortalized through uh, Hollywood and the, the mythology of the Wild West and cowboys and Indians they always have that one chief um, so traditionally and and what we carry on today is our people have different chiefs um, I could go more into detail about the roles of different chiefs but I'll try to be brief because um, there are other people I want to talk about. So we also have a tribal council. 
and our council are um, our chiefs, our clan mothers, who I'll mention in a moment, and uh, other people who have specific responsibilities and hold uh, you know res specific um, areas where they can give very good counsel. And our council meets. And as a group, we decide uh, the best way to move forward when questions come up, you know, what should the nation do or what's best for our people. And that is traditional. There's always been a, a group of people um, uh, that have conferred in our, in our society rather than one person saying, do this, and this is my decree. Uh, something very important to know is is that we also have clan mothers. I've I, I hear often people either say or ask um, if the Lenape people are matriarchal. They've heard this, and my response is I I resist the term matriarchal. I think the word that a lot of those people are searching for is matrilineal. Uh, we are traditionally a matrilineal culture. Uh, possessions and, and titles are passed down through the woman's line. Um, traditionally, we have different clans of the Lenape people. Uh, Munsi, Wolf Clan, Unami, Turtle Clan, Unalaktigo, Turkey Clan. And uh, traditionally, if I, as a Munsi Lenape, would marry a, a Unami woman, um, I would move to her settlement, move in with her clan and become part of that community. Um, the uh, our clan mothers, and they always they they haven't always been called clan mothers. They have had different titles or sometimes no title. But whatever name they were given, uh, our our council and our chiefs have always received their guidance from a group of the most respected elder women in our community, um, and those are who we call clan mothers today. Excellent. Thank you. That yeah. it, hearing you say it, it's like, well, yeah, that totally sounds like a very Western idea. Uh, yeah. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, but could you just in a brief, uh, I know we're running short on time. Uh, Bill asked, what would recognition do for the Lenape? What would it mean for the Lenape in a short bullet point? What would that be? In a bullet point? Um, recognition in and of itself at the state level means absolutely nothing. It, it all comes down to the agreement that the individual state and nation agree on. So that's the short answer. It's um, whatever the, the state agrees upon. Now, the things that we are hoping for are things that affect our identity, uh, like the ability to um, sell our crafts to raise money for the nation as Native American crafts. You're not allowed to say that unless your your nation is recognized by the government. Um, the ability to use things like uh, eagle feathers in our ceremonies, which are very important, um, and and we are glad there are laws there to stop people from poaching eagles, uh, but we would like to be able to to take eagle feathers off the river and bring them into ceremonies and have uh, some exceptions made for that. And and the other major thing is our ability to protect the environment. Like I said before, um, uh, nobody has to talk to us. Nobody has to recognize us. We we don't want and would never have the power to say yes, that can happen and this can't happen. But we want to be someone who uh, is brought to the table so we know these things are going on and can participate in the discussion. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a great question in from Lindsay, who's curious to know if your cultural stories uh, uh, have descriptions of evolving ecosystems um, and shifts in horticultural representation as the plants moved with the people. Uh, for instance, she brings up native, uh, the gooseberry coming in from the Midwest region, joining the land of New Jersey. Uh, do your stories reflect that? Absolutely, they do. And this is my academic area. My my area is, is global mythology. Um, and of course, I focus on, on Lenape, uh, stories um, but it is a fascinating endeavor when you look at it from that perspective and our stories throughout um, the our, our time in our homelands and then throughout our forced removal and assimilation with 
uh, both other tribes in our paths and the the colonists here um, have continued to contribute to stories. And we have stories that talk about buffalo. We have stories that talk about um, mountain goats. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we have stories from all of our communities in the different areas that they ended up. And it's, it's one, uh, I don't even want to say a silver lining, but something that has come out of our people spreading and, and becoming uh, assimilated and, and involved with other cultures is that um, our, our stories have just developed so richly in so many different areas. And there are many different strands and strains of, of very rich uh, and, and uh, geographically specific cultural stories, uh, you know, from, from our Oklahoma to our Canada to our homeland communities. All right. Fantastic. And I know we're at 8.15, but if you'll uh, grant me your blessing for one more question mm -hmm. um, from Lena, this is, uh, I she's a culinary teacher at a local high school and wants to incorporate a unit on Native American cuisine. Can you speak to a traditional recipe that they could potentially cook in the classroom or recommended resources where she could find these uh, Lenape cooking recipes, you know? Yes, um, on our website, which thank you for putting that in the chat, uh, we have an online trading post. Uh, and um, one of the things we offer there to raise money for the nation is our Lenape Harvest Cookbook. And as director of education, I work with schools and, and colleges, and I've actually done programs where they have made some of the food from our cookbook. And it's it's wonderful. Um, and a lot of it is very easy and, and relatively inexpensive to make on in that kind of atmosphere. One of the most popular uh, and easier things to make is Three Sisters Soup. Um, and there's a, a couple different strains of making that. Of course, it, if you don't know Three Sisters, it involves uh, beans, corn, and squash. Um, but uh, feel free to, to email me. I'm happy to talk to your culinary department um, or, or you, or whoever you'd like me to talk to. And also uh, do look at the L Lenape Harvest Cookbook because it's got wonderful stuff in it. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we got to get you out to come come cook some stuff at the preserve uh <laughs> as as many of our guests will tell you i am super food motivated <laughs> nice this sounds super cool um all right my friends uh with that i want to give another huge thank you to adam for for this amazing amazing evening um you really did make this something special so thank you i want to thank all of our attendees for joining us and showing your support, not only for the preserve, but for the Lenape and wanting to learn more. Um, and if you're watching this again as the recording and didn't catch it live, um, pop down in the chat, hit the thumbs up button, like it, and all those great things. Um, anything last from you, Adam, last thoughts, last uh, shout outs? Thank you for attending. Um, the biggest challenge we face is our continued erasure here. So carry this information forward and if you have the opportunity let people know that we are still here thank Excellent. you and some folks have already let us know in the chat too that they have uh gone and, and signed that petition and like i said friends i'll make sure in my follow-up email i'll include the link right to the lenape nation website um and with that my friends i want to thank you once again hope to see you next week hope to see you at the preserve this weekend um enjoy and as always keep on experiencing what's natural and learn what's native. Take care, everyone.